I'm Kyle Salmon. And I'm Corey Astle. Welcome to Conservative Minds, a podcast about conservative ideas and thinkers. We explore what it means to call yourself a conservative, where conservatism has been, and where it's going. Each week, we select readings and conduct a discussion to share with you our investigation. Join the conversation by liking us on Facebook or following us on Twitter at ConsMinds. That's at C-O-N-S-M-I-N-D-S. For episode 74, we read The Concept of the Political, written by Carl Schmitt, published in 1932. Carl Schmitt was born in 1888 in Westphalia, Prussia, in what became part of the German Empire. He studied law in Berlin, graduating in 1915. He became a professor of constitutional law, best known for his critiques of Enlightenment liberalism and parliamentary democracy. Schmidt was a supporter of National Socialism, and in 1933, he joined the Nazi Party. He became editor-in-chief of the Nazi Journal for Lawyers. He defended Hitler's murder of political opponents and called for a cleansing of Jewish influence from law and science. Schmidt was captured by American forces in 1945. After the war, he refused to renounce his Nazi participation and was thereby banned from academic teaching. He continued to write scholarly works on international law. He died in 1985. So as we begin our conversation today, Kyle and I want to acknowledge to you the sensitivity of discussing a book written by a complicit Nazi. We're not experts on Schmidt, but from everything we've read, he seems like a truly evil human being. And we want to state up front, categorically, that we find him despicable, and nothing we say here today is intended to justify his life, his horrible behavior, or even his political thought. However, we believe that we can evaluate ideas on their own merits, and we strongly believe that hiding or censoring ideas will only drive them into dark corners where they will fester and grow. We believe sunshine serves as a much more potent disinfectant. So this season, we expect to read several books with, with which we'll disagree with the authors. And but Kyle and I believe that a comprehensive understanding of conservatism and the right requires us to pick up some books and be honest, pick up some books by authors we would otherwise dismiss. And in the case of Carl Schmidt, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy captures the situation well, I believe. It says, Schmidt was an acute observer and analyst of the weaknesses of constitutionalism and liberal cosmopolitanism, but there can be little doubt that his preferred cure turned out to be infinitely worse than the disease. Our task here at Cons Minds, we believe, is to study and to understand and to be honest and to be comprehensive so that we can chart a better course for conservatism in the future. Kyle, is there anything you wanted to add to that? No, I agree with all that. Uh, yeah, I think it's important to read things you don't agree with. I mean, we, we've done it before and we'll do it again. We shouldn't have to say this, but in this age where even acknowledging something is will be considered an endorsement by people who are uh, politically opposite to you. Yeah, I think it's good to get out of the way. We, we don't endorse Schmidt or Nazism or fascism generally. Well said. All right, let's get to the book. So in this book, Schmidt wants to establish a definition of political. What does it mean? What does political mean? What does it signify? Politics is usually understood as the activities or machinations of government. That's what you would learn in a political science 101 class. The Greeks understood it as a set of activities associated with making decisions in groups, particularly as it relates to resources or, you know, groups. Uh, dynamics. But Schmidt has a unique definition that's really interesting. And I think in many ways we'll disagree with it, but in other ways, uh, I think it sheds some light on our current situation. So to dive into it, for Schmidt, he says, a definition of the political can only be obtained by discovering and identifying specifically political categories, for the political has its own criteria. The political must therefore rest on its own ultimate distinctions to which all behavior with a specifically political purpose can be traced. And that specific political distinction to which political actions and motives can be traced is the distinction between friend and enemy. The terms friend and enemy are to be taken in their concrete existential sense, not as metaphors or symbols, least of all in a private individualistic sense as a psychological expression of private feelings and tendencies. The friend-enemy distinction corresponds to the relatively independent criteria of other distinctions, good and evil in the moral, beautiful and ugly in the aesthetic. The distinction between friend and enemy denotes the extreme intensity of a connection or a separation, an association or disassociation, 
it can exist theoretically and practically. All right, so that's a lot of that's a lot of deep thought, but the bottom line for Schmidt is politi- pol- uh, the definition of political. Political is not a genre, but a relationship that's being described. And so something is political if it characterizes a relationship of friend versus enemy. It's an us versus them situation. So anytime we're talking about politics or political, it's referencing one group versus another. In in his telling, he's much more focused on one nation versus another nation. So in the international politics, international political, it's uh, American capitalism versus Soviet communism or something like that. But it's always one country or nation or group versus another. And if you don't have that relationship of one versus another, then it's not actually political. Then you're talking about some sort of other relationship or some other element of, of sociology, but you're not talking about what's political. So that's a pretty heavy handed view and something that, you know, we, I've certainly never thought of it that way. No, I I haven't either, but I think it it does explain the way a lot of people think. And it's when we talk about tribalism in politics, I think this is it. I mean, if you were, if we were still organized in tribes in the, the sort of prehistoric sense, that's how we would see the other tribes, right? They're the enemy. It's not because they're wrong or because they are, you know, on land that we think belongs to us. It's just they're the other. We fight them. And we, I think, in a liberal democracy, don't like to think that that's how we behave. But I think there are people who do, especially the people who, for whom politics is the highest good, the highest thing in their minds. You know, the people who have that cable news on 24-7 and just are animated by it. You know, more so than anything else. I mean, you know, that's not to say no one should watch cable news, but you know what I mean. It's the people mm-hmm. who, who place that at the apex of their lives, that, that sort of owning the libs or owning the cons, you know, depending. And I could see why there was a lot of that in Schmidt's time when he was writing this book in, in, in Weimar, Germany. You know, it was a country that was recovering from defeat in World War I, loss of empire. You know, they were... They were trying to be a democracy for the first time, really. I mean, they'd had elections before, but this was the first time it was really supposed to be a republic. And a lot of people weren't buying into it. A lot of people wanted the, the Kaiser back. A lot of people wanted communism. The fascists were kind of splitting the difference and saying both to each side. But it was that I think he would see that friend-enemy distinction playing out in their politics because there was no there was no rally around the flag. There was no politics stops at the water's edge. These were people that hated each other, and yeah. there was—I mean, there were centrist parties in Germany, but they weren't—they weren't that many, and they didn't have the tradition that we have and that other Western democracies have of not killing each other in the streets over politics. So, I think if you don't have anything else like community or or God or a national tradition of of liberalism that you can fall back on, and every time then the most important thing, the thing that organizes you is, is, is this, is politics. And it is, you know, the people who, I mean, I don't want to jump right to it, but the people who invaded the Capitol building see politics as friend versus enemy. Yeah. The people in Portland who were trying to burn down the courthouse see politics as friend versus enemy, you know? And they're like, when the, when the proud boys and the Antifa clash in the streets, they're, they're not thinking about our shared Americanness or our shared humanity or, Let's look for the things we have in common, guys. They they just want to smash and kill. Well, uh, usually don't kill, but some of them do. You know, they, they, they're they seeing this is war. And that's that's what Schmidt says is the political thing. You know, the, the thing that can say, we're going to send you to war for it. You know, the organizing thing, that this the nation state thing. That's, what's, that's what radicals are and reactionaries at the far ends of our political spectrum are, are feeling right now. And I think it's, it's why so many people and then the, the rest of us are just really turned off to that. And I think you see that, that sort of intense partisanship played out on television and, and in the press. And it turns off a lot of regular people to politics. Because they say, look at these, these maniacs. They're obsessed with politics. Don't they have anything else going on that they, and, and, you know, you and I are, we live politics, you know, it's, it's our jobs. But I think 
there's a step above that that Schmidt's describing. So I think those are great illustrations. Part of me thinks, though, that Schmidt is what he's trying to say is it's not just the, the extremes. He's trying to strip the veneer off this whole conversation and say, when it comes right down to brass tacks, when it comes down to it, we can pretend like we, we can have these high minded ideals about what politics is about, about getting things done, about moving the ball forward. But when push comes to shove, what it's really about is winning about one group over another. It's and at the international level. It's beating the enemy at uh, the at our political level it's republicans and democrats wanting to beat one another in elections this really was highlighted for me this week because i had several conversations with people different people uh, and just fortuitously about about the you know current situation and whatever and uh so i had more than one person say to me like the the most important thing is winning the election so that we can move in a direction that we think is the best policy. And it just really struck me that I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but I am saying that it really struck me that what they really meant to say is not so much that we want to move our policy forwards. It is like, we've got to win. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it just really, it's just interesting because we're having this conversation about Schmidt this week, because I think you're totally right that the, the extremes, especially right now in our current, current moment is just really illustrate this. I think plainly, but I wonder if we, if we looked inside ourselves and, and we're really honest, um, I think he's pushing us to say like, what, what really is politics? I mean, we, we like to say that it's, that the purpose of politics is to get stuff done and to move the country forward, but we have very different visions in this country about what moving forward is and what progress means versus uh, degradation. And so. I don't know. This is, I, I don't have a complete thought on this because he both knocks me back and makes me think and at the same time like completely turns my stomach because I don't want him to be right. Yeah, I think that's right. I, I mean, we, we definitely have that in all of us. Uh, tribalism, you know, um, friend versus enemy is in our hearts and even when we don't want it to be, even when we try to be better people. And I think, you know, part of living in a liberal democracy is trying to appeal to those better angels of our nature, like Lincoln said, but when it comes time to vote, I might not vote for the Republican every time, but I really don't like voting for the Democrat. And that's, that's, there's something to that. There's something to that. Like, you know, if, oh, if this same person were an independent, I might consider it, but I've spent half my life being against the Democrats. And it's not because I think they're evil or we're, we're at war with them, but there is that, mm, I don't know. I can't go to the other tribe. I can't, that's my political enemy, you know, is, I mean, Schmidt says that the other, the stranger, and it's sufficient for his nature that he is, in a especially intense way, existentially something different and alien. So that in the extreme case, conflict, conflicts with him are possible. I don't want to think of my fellow Americans that way, but, you know, sometimes it, you know, it's, it's emotional. And I think we want to think we don't vote with our emotions, but yeah, uh, it, it's in there. And I, 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 I I like what you said because it's he's speaking to something that people people do behave this way and other people think about behaving this way but I don't, I don't want that to be true i want us to be better just like the founding fathers didn't want there to be factions right they didn't, you know that was the, the biggest oversight in the constitution is they thought we weren't going to have political parties or at least not nationwide permanent type political parties you know they thought they thought there'd be shifting coalitions but the country was too big for that sort of us versus them it was all going to be because you know when they made the constitution there were different parties in each state and it, you know they weren't really aligned with each other but once we have a polity all of a sudden everything comes into either for or against on a bunch of questions and pretty soon you've you've got you're staring across an aisle and you know it's it is a friend enemy feel even when we like to think we're better than that yeah he says, in psychological reality, the enemy is easily treated as evil and ugly, which I think is transparently true that, uh, well, that's how we tend to view, you know, enemies or whatever, because every distinction and grouping, especially the political, as it is the strongest and most intense, draws on all other usable distinctions for support, right? So you, you have a, he, he, he actually goes to pains to say the political enemy need not be morally evil. 
He need not be aesthetically ugly. He need not be an economic competitor. It may even seem advantageous to do business with him. But in psychological reality, even if he, we're, we're, we have a way of treating the, the enemy as evil and ugly, even if he's not, because every, every grouping draws on other usable distinctions, he says, for support. Again, we're a, we're a conservative podcast, and you and I have had many conversations about human nature and believe that there is one. And, I, and unfortunately, I believe that this is part of human nature is that we have, we have this tendency to follow these dark paths. But he says, consequently, the reverse is also true. That which is morally evil, aesthetically ugly, or economically harmful need not be the enemy. And you're like, that's actually kind of true. And I think that we see that right now. You know, mm-hmm. so, I, I can think of someone who I find to be, uh, you know, many of those um, characteristics. That which is morally good, aesthetically beautiful, and economically useful is not necessarily friend in the political sense of the word. So ultimately, what he's really challenging us here, he's really challenging us to say, to, to look inward and, and ask ourselves, like the people that we align ourselves with or the other, our, let's say our group mates, our tribe mates, are some of them morally evil and aesthetically ugly or economically harmful? At the same time, folks on the other side, are some of them not particularly morally evil, not aesthetically ugly, not necessarily economic competitors? I mean, what he's saying is, these are all factors, but they're not the, 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 the distinguishing factor. They're not dispositive. The dispositive factor is who is your existential enemy and on which side are you on? And it's just, I think, I think he is really unveiling a, a really ugly element of, of human nature. I don't no, know. I, what do you think? I think that's, that's exactly right. Those things matter to us, but not more, at least in the political sphere, they don't matter more than politics itself. I mean, I've, I've heard many Republicans say about President Obama that they thought he lived a good life and seemed like a good husband and father. I agree with that. I would but, say that. But none of them voted for him because of that. <laughs> right? I mean, right. <laughs> I mean, not that the guys he ran against were, were odious in that way. But, you know, it didn't, it didn't change the fact that politically he was on the other side. And there were good reasons for that. That wasn't just about tribalism or hate. It was, you know, his policies were bad, I, I thought. Yeah. And, I thought they were bad for this country. Right. But yeah, but the fact that, you know, we might say any number of good things about them doesn't, doesn't move the dial. You know, it's not going to, not going to change my vote. And you know, like you said, the opposite of course is certainly true. I think that's part of the, you know, I think a lot about falling trust in society. I think we've talked about it. I mean, we had, we had Kevin Vallier on a while back and talked about his book on that. I, I think part of the reason we, don't trust institutions is people within the institution, the, the, the party say, never call out those other bad things on our own side. Right. We never say, Hey, you're not living up to the ideals that this party stands for. We only point to the other side. And that's not just us. The Democrats do the same thing. You know, each of the, each of us is willing to cover up for, you know, I mean, it's coming the week we're recording this, there's all sorts of stuff finally coming out about Andrew Cuomo that everybody kind of already knew. And it's only coming out now because Democrats think he's used up and there's more to gain by helping bring him down now that he's already being brought down. But they covered for him for years. He was always known as a gross person. Unlikable. Unpleasant. And uh, pretty venal, as it turns out. But they would never, we criticize the heck out of him, right? Because, because he's a Democrat, so we can. But, uh, you know, if there were a governor in our party who was the same way, you know, we might admit it to our friends. Yeah, that guy, he's, he's gross. But we wouldn't, I probably wouldn't write as many stories about it, you know. We wouldn't because uh, because we feel like there's too much at stake, right? Yeah. I think that's what Schmidt's saying too, is that, mm-hmm. yeah, you might disagree with someone or you might find someone distasteful on your side, but so much is at, at stake. Because in the political, like any undermining of someone on your side is uh, a gain in this zero sum game for the other side. And anyway, it's, <laughs> it, it, I, I don't think he's completely wrong. I, I hate that, that, that he's not, but um, I think that's what's getting to me too. Yeah, no, I think what you said in the, in the introduction, uh, that encyclopedia quote that he's a, he was an astute observer. And the, yeah, he's, he's seeing the ugliness in, our, in, our, in us. And that's what we need to try and do better at. And that's why I, 
that's why what I said before about having something higher than politics, because I think the people who are really swing voters and who do vote based on the way they feel about the candidate in non-political ways are, I think, tend to be the least engaged politically, you know, and maybe that's good. You know, I mean, it's good that the country has enough people like that who aren't, you know, on real clear politics every day, reading 10 articles or, oh, that's for sure. Yeah. you know, cause I mean, sometimes I'm, do I'm that guy sometimes. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I write them, you know, but, <laughs> But I think it's it's sometimes good that there are people who will, you know, sometimes look at the two candidates and say, "No, I'm going to vote for Ross Perot," you know, or or I'm going to I'm going to write. I, I can't stand either of these guys. It's good because to them, there's something more important than than politics. And I think to Schmidt, that is ridiculous. He thinks they're probably deluding themselves because politics is control of the state, and the state is the thing. You know, he says. That he says the the prodigo ergo obligo is the catego ergo sum of the state. That is to say, prodigo ergo obligo is the Rome, uh, from Roman law that says I protect, therefore I obligate. The state protects mm -hmm. its members, so we owe the state certain obligations. Mm -hmm. So conflict over the state is is the highest in Schmidt's mind because that's the thing that can obligate you. You know, other institutions, your church, your union. Your, your job, they can't obligate you in the same way the state can. They can't tell you to go to war or tell you not to go to war. And that's, I mean, what is more of an obligation than that, to kill and be killed? This is, there is no higher thing that a, a government could ask of its citizens to risk their lives and to take other men's lives. That's, you know, Schmidt points out, that is uh, the most serious thing that any of us could do as a human. It's something that we shouldn't ask lightly of our citizens mm -hmm. and yet the state can ask that the state has that real power and that so i think to him that makes it that makes it the highest and most important thing that that is the political that is the thing but i don't know it's 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 funny that when we've read so many different people across the right and you know people would say schmidt is on the right and people would say milton friedman is on the right <laughs> and they don't overlap <laughs> at all <laughs> you know? i mean good. friedman would say none of this is true i mean of yeah. course yeah this of course, the state can send you to war, but you know, libertarians like that see you know see liberty as as higher than the state. You know, and just a lot of religious conservatives will say that religion is higher than the state, and you know, a lot of us will say that you know, push game to shove, our family is higher than the state, our community is higher than the state. But none of those things can make you go to war. And to Schmidt, that is a, a very important distinction. Yeah, he also believes that liberal democracy has basically papered over. Uh, all of these facts about humanity. He says, liberalism has tried to dissolve the enemy from a business standpoint into a competitor, from the intellectual standpoint into a debate opponent. opponent. And I think we got a little bit of this when we were reading R. R. Reno and the, the death of the strong gods mm -hmm. in that there's been a, a strong movement and for good reason since World War II to try to move away from, from uh, big narratives and and a uh, deep societal meaning and, and belief in something because of the, the danger of nationalism, let's say, or, or at least the fear of it or, or a fear of communism. And, but he says, Schmidt says, whether one considers it reprehensible or not, and perhaps find, finds barbarism in the fact that peoples still really group themselves according to friend and enemy, our hopes that someday the distinction will disappear from the earth some believe it good or right to pretend for educational purposes that there are no more enemies at all. Yet that peoples group themselves according to the distinction of friend and enemy, that is that this distinction is still real today, cannot reasonably be denied. I mean, I think that's a direct, I think that's a, di a direct rebuttal of, of the, this, um, you know, broader sort of, cosmopolitan ideal open borders and yeah. you know let's just everybody love each other and it's I, I don't mean to make fun of that point of view because i i do think that it's preferable and it's a it's a it's a good ideal it's just uh i guess i'm skeptical that it has that it's realistic and and schmidt just he just finds it completely laughable yeah there's a strong current of anti-League of Nations sentiment in this book, and a lot of which is kind of outdated now since the League of Nations didn't last much beyond this book. 
But it was the you know it was the pro it was the uh, precursor to the UN. You know, it was this idea after World War One that everything is going to be cool now. We're going to we're going to figure out our disputes in this general assembly situation instead of sending thousands and thousands of men to die in the trenches like we just did. So Schmidt thinks that's bunk. It's not going to happen. And he, well, I mean, it. He was right about that. It did not last. I mean, because of his country but <laughs> but other countries you know japan was already doing stuff in, you know in china by this time too so it wasn't just germany but they were mm, definitely the number one baddie so he that that is running through the book this utopianism of world peace and he thinks it is just ridiculous and is he right i, I don't know i mean i think there's less war than there used to be how much of that is because of liberalism or pacifism and how much of it is because of we all have nukes na aimed at each other and nobody wants to, you know, incinerate millions. I mean, I, I, I think it's more that I think that rather than the UN or, you know, it's pre predecessor to league of nations is going to save us. You know, that we didn't blow ourselves up and the Soviet union up because of our liberalism or our shared humanity or any of the things that Schmidt thinks are laughable. We we didn't do it because it was just it would have been just too bad, even for two powers that did not like each other one bit. Mm -hmm. So he's he's not wrong about that. I I mean I still think you know if you watch you watch Star Trek and you know the whole world's united and everybody's all very nice and peaceful and that that feels nice. I mean it would be nice that it would be nice for America not to be in two wars right now. Right, I, they're small wars compared to the things that. Schmidt lived through and, and people of his generation lived through, but there's still men dying in foreign battlefields and, and women too these days. And that's, uh, you know, it's, you can understand why people would want something better, especially after the, just, he's writing this in 32. It's not that long removed from World War One, and people were still shocked at just how ugly and awful that was. And then the one that came after it, even worse. So, I know, again, it's he's recognizing something that we don't want to admit, and that's that we will always divide ourselves. We always have divided ourselves. And we'll say, I think it's less bloody than it used to be. And I don't know if that refutes what Schmidt's saying, or it's just a matter of changed circumstances and changed technology. So I think the evidence does run against him in this the point that he makes about liberalism trying to dissolve enemies into economic competitors. Because that is something that, that uh, America has done around the world is uh, tried to integrate economically and move a capitalist system around. Of course, there's folks on the left who would be incredibly critical of that, but it has worked up to till now with, with China. Now, if we move move into the future and there's a decoupling between the U.S. and China in terms economically, I, don't th I think that that pretty plainly it creates more danger in terms of a uh, potential conflict in the future. There's less likely to be conflict when we're so intertwined, more likely to be conflict when there's less to lose. And I think that's true with where Russia is today now. And it could be true with where China is moving forward. But up to this point, I think uh, integrating economies really creates a situation where there's so much to lose that it's too risky. Even if you, even if there are elements of, you know, of, of different countries who, who would just as soon go to war or whatever. So I think he's, I don't want to say he's wrong, but I think there's a lot of evidence uh, pointing in, in the opposite direction of what he was saying there. But I guess the, the more interesting question to me is, will that work over the long term? Because it's, uh, it's certainly a Band-Aid that uh, that'll work in the short term. Can it work in the long term? I think we're going to see how that plays out with China to find out whether whether it can work long term or not. See, I, I don't know that that uh, trade and integration actually cause peace. Uh, uh, people say that, and it makes sense to us. But you know, I was trying to look it up as you were talking because I, I have heard it said that Germany and France were each other's biggest trading partners before the Second World War. Mm, yeah. I need a citation on that because I remember trying to look it up before and I could not find it. So it might not be true, but. Uh, they did trade a great deal and 
right before Germany invaded the Soviet Union, they were trading a great deal too. And that was right. Oh, good point. You know, and America before the revolution pretty much only had to trade with Britain as we talked about in the Adam Smith episode because of the mercantile system. So I think it, I think for, it certainly makes the establishment less willing to get into war because they're the ones seeing that, you know, the people who are doing those trade deals are seeing the other side, talking to them, sharing something together, which is a business deal, which is, that's not nothing. I mean, you know, it's people coming to agreement over something, making each other better off again, as, as uh, Adam Smith explained, but I don't know that um, familiarity necessarily breeds friendship. I mean, the, the old proverb is that it breeds contempt. I, I would like to think it's true. I do think spreading liberalism, it builds those trade relationships, but it also does kind of spread a shared culture or a shared element to our culture that makes war less thinkable between, you know, I mean, there used to be a, a theory that no two nations with the McDonald's had ever gone to war. Mm-hmm. And I think that, I think when we bombed Serbia, there was an exception to that. We weren't at war, <laughs> but it was, we were still, it was a war. We were dropping bombs, but it's still pretty rare. Because, you know, I, I guess when you get to that, maybe that's the, the, the Fukuyama point from a few seasons ago, but when you're both fully liberal countries, it does seem like less of a good idea to go to war. You know, like why would why would you one even start with the other? Everybody's, you know, it's there's money to be made. There's people are moving back and forth, visiting each other. It seems like it, that does work. I don't know why. Because, you know, I mean, it used to be every country was monarchies and they still fought each other. But when two countries are liberal democracies, they seem to do that a lot less. So that, yeah. is, that is something. And so maybe you're right that there is a, a trend against what Schmidt was talking about. Yeah. Well, you make some good points, too. So shifting gears just a tiny bit, he talks about uh, domestic antagonisms. And you touched on this a little bit already. But he says, so mu- much of this conversation has been focused on nation versus nation and so when we're talking about friends and enemies we're talking about national friends versus national enemies but he says the equation of political equals party politics is possible in other words the we we change the the level of analysis from the international nation versus nation to this lower level of analysis of party versus party republicans versus democrats we have talked about this a little bit already but He says this becomes possible when the idea of a comprehensive political unit, that's the state, so uh, the nation, that encompasses all domestic political parties and their antagonisms, loses strength, and as a result, domestic antagonisms become more intense than the unified foreign policy in opposition to another state. When the party antagonisms within a state become the sole political distinctions, that is when the most extreme degree of domestic political tension is reached, namely domestic friend enemy groupings, and not those of foreign policy determine the groupings in an armed conflict. Thus, in the case of such a primacy of domestic politics, the real possibility of conflict, which must always be present to speak of politics, no longer refers to war between states and empires, but to civil war. And I just feel like that was, that's just, uh, I just, I felt like a deep foreboding when I, when I read that mm-hmm. <laughs> because I believe sadly that that's where we find ourselves today, that, uh, our interest, if, uh, if he's correct about the political being a friend and enemy relationship, our, I mean, we've taken our eye off the ball. We don't feel like an America anymore, an America versus uh, uh, um, America versus uh, communist Soviet Union has dissolved, and so where are we now? I think I think there are too many people who just deeply hate each other here in America, and it, we're not just talking about the usual domestic politics of I think we should increase taxes for X, and the other side saying like I think that's a waste of money, and we shouldn't raise taxes or something like that. But instead, I just saw some really fascinating and deeply troubling polling that just came out this past week that showed the issues that uh, each of the parties are the most concerned about. And uh, for the Democrats, their number one biggest concern in America right now is Trump supporters. Yeah. (laughs) For Republicans, the top issue was immigration. 
which is interesting in and of itself. But the point being like, and for Republicans, this probably the second or third thing was, you know, the other side, like liberal media and, and Hollywood and so forth. And uh, on the one hand, we were swimming in that soup and have been for a long time. So it doesn't seem like news. On the other hand, you know, it just really highlights the fact that our focus now is, is, I mean, I think the level of analysis is where Schmidt's going here with um, the, the domestic antagonisms, like our friend versus friend and enemy. It just doesn't feel like it's an international thing anymore because I just don't feel like we're united. Instead, it's a it's an us versus them like culture war uh, in in America. Yeah, yeah. Those polls from uh, I think it was from Echelon Insights were uh, pretty surprising. It's it's weird to ask people what do you think the biggest problem in the country is, and they name a, a portion of the country. Yeah, you know, it used to be you'd see some issue at the top. I think I think in the way we turn against ourselves, though, I think it's the same problem that Schmidt points out with liberalism itself. Is that it used to have an enemy? Liberalism fought against feudalism and aristocracy. In the von Mises book we read last year. He talked about liberalism was the first universal philosophy, the one that everybody could have access to. This was revolutionary, and it definitely made enemies of the aristocracy who had their their theories that were very you know class based. Each class had its own things, and they had most of the good ones, and that was that. So liberalism was a fight. I mean, that's why there were liberal revolutions, but there aren't anymore because liberalism won. There's everybody around the world is pushing some sort of philosophy that is universalist and that he says is equalizing and leveling and makes us all better off. That didn't used to be the case before the rise of liberalism. So I think deprived of an enemy, Schmidt says liberalism is not political anymore. But I, th I think it's kind of the same thing is we don't have a, we're not fighting the Nazis anymore. We're not fighting the Soviets anymore. We, we won. We won both. And that's yeah. great. We're not even fighting economic depression in the way we were in the right. 20s and 30s. And again, that's good. We, you know, we are, we've got peace and prosperity, which is what everyone says they want. But we still want to fight somebody. And it, so when nobody's left, we fight ourselves. And it's, uh, you know, we turn on ourselves. And, and because I think there's something in our, our brains that wants to elevate, that wants an enemy. And so whatever enemy we find, we're going to nominate, we're going to elevate to, the enemy, the bad, the other, the the one we've got to bend all our energies against. And that was great when our enemies were really bad, <laughs> but mm -hmm. now it's us. So it's it's like an autoimmune disorder. We're just immune system's just fighting itself because there's no germs in it. Right. <laughs> so I I think he's a. Uh, I think that that lends credence to his theory of of the way man is. Um, it's just. We hope it's not the way man would be. And that, and that kind of gets to our, our usual point on these podcasts comes down to, you know, human nature exists and they're trying to make a utopian system that denies human nature will always fail. Well, this too is a part of human nature. And it's not to say, I mean, there are a lot of bad things that are a part of human nature and we still outlaw them and try to keep them from happening. You know, there, there are many crimes like, what the lawyers call the malum in se crimes, the things that are bad in themselves, murder, you know, assault, arson, you know, these things. They are a part of human nature for some humans, yet we outlaw them. Mm -hmm. But when you get to the political stage, when you get to ideas, you can't build a system on ideas that all of humanity rejects. So I guess what I can say is I hope that some of humanity rejects the sort of intense tribal political warfare that Schmidt's describing. Yeah. And just, I fear that that's not the case. It does make you wonder whether an outside enemy is required in order for us to, <laughs> to, mm. to unite and play as a team or whatever. If, uh, if Schmidt is correct, I think we both kind of think maybe to some extent he is, but hope that he's not actually, but to the extent he is correct. I mean, it all, he, he's almost making, making the point that, if we don't have an outside enemy to fight, then we are going to fight enemies within. We're going to fight ourselves. And so I, I wish that this pandemic, you know, the coronavirus could be what we 
we mm -hmm. circle the wagons, rally around that flag, and yeah. fight it together. It's pretty and bad. I think that opportunity was there, and it was just missed for, yeah. for any number of reasons. But you know, political leadership is part of it. But I think that's a shame, and I hope it isn't required that we have a, a World War Three or or that China does rise to a point of real danger for us to get our act together. Those were some good closing thoughts. Any anything else you want to end with? No, I think that I think that's about it. And this this book kind of turns a, a mirror on the ugliest part of ourselves, and uh, it's a lot of it's food for thought, I guess, to to mix metaphors there. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I didn't I didn't really enjoy reading this, but um, but again, as as we said in our at the outset, like we we've got to contend with these ideas, and and sometimes you have to rip the veneer off off the the beautiful picture to kind of wake up a little bit and realize like yeah we do have other problems too and some of them are pretty systemic and uh you know part of our nature but anyway all right that's carl schmidt catch us next time